What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. All right, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. All right, everybody, welcome back to another week of Da Vinci Cases. Very excited for this case. Just a big announcement in the past week, Da Vinci Cases hit 10,000 all time downloads. So we're really excited about that here at uh, DaVinci Academy, and we want to just thank everybody for continuing to tune in for this uh, and listen to the audio and watch the video and, and subscribe on YouTube and subscribe on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all the other uh, audio platforms out there. So we really appreciate your guys' support, and we're, again, we're really thrilled to, to bring this to you and, and so thrilled to hit uh, that 10,000 downloads. And so we've got plenty more coming for you and uh, really excited about this. So thanks again, guys. Appreciate it. All right, so for this case, we have a 27-year-old man with no significant past medical history, and he's brought to the emergency department after being found out in the desert. So if he's stranded out in the desert, he's probably dehydrated. He hasn't been getting enough fluids, um, so he, he's definitely going to be volume down. Um, no significant past medical history. You know, young. this is otherwise a young, healthy individual. So likely, you know, instead of also having to manage some kind of chronic condition, the main task at hand is just making sure this guy is, is hydrated and, and, and stabilized. So he's very thirsty, uh, which is understandable. And then his vitals in the ED are 37.3 degrees Celsius, so he's afebrile. His heart rate is 111, so he's fairly tachycardic. His blood pressure is 90 over 68, so he's hypotensive. The respirations are 18, which is roughly normal. Uh, and then his O2 sat is 98%. So he's breathing okay on room air, but he's hypotensive and he's tachycardic. He's likely hypotensive to being dehydrated. And then the tachycardic is just the tachycardic response to help, you know, your heart's compensatory response to increase perfusion. Although the patient is oriented to person, so he knows who he is at least, he is lethargic and confused about his situation. So Usually in a young person, otherwise healthy, without, you know, their significant comorbidities, they're dehydrated, they're hypotensive, that he's probably just not getting enough perfusion to his brain. He's probably, you know, as a result, he's just kind of foggy, confused. Uh, so he's just not getting enough, you know, he doesn't have enough circulating blood volume to get adequate perfusion. So we do a physical exam. This is notable for dry oral mucous membranes and decreased skin turgor. These are both, uh, you know, hallmark exam findings for dehydration. So labs are drawn and the patient is started on IV normal saline. So, you know, in a situation like this, usually the first thing you're going to do after you assess them is start them on IV fluids. And so the question is, is which of the following graphs best illustrates this patient's condition before IV normal saline was started? So before we started them on IV fluids, which of these graphs best represents his osmolarity and, his, and the volume of his intracellular fluid and his extracellular fluid? So to summarize these findings, it's a young man found in the desert. Uh, he's thirsty, hypotensive, and tachycardic. Uh, his physical exam, again, was known, notable for signs of dehydration, dry oral mucous membranes, and decreased skin turgor. As a result of this, uh, you can conclude the patient is suffering from severe de dehydration, hence the reason he was started on the IV uh, normal saline. So if we go through these diagrams, these are just kind of simple diagrams to keep track of changes in ICF and ECF uh, volume and osmolarity and kind of how those can change in response to different uh, physiological disturbances or changes, if you will. You know, we're going to do this diagram here in the normal state. So you have, if you remember, two thirds of the water volume of your body is actually in the cells. It's intracellular fluid. And then one third is extracellular, which is, you know, blood and, you know, interstitial fluid. And so a way you can analyze these different disturbances, and then another thing, if you remember the osmolarity, the ICF osmo is in normal state equal to the ECF osmolarity, which is about 300, depending on the textbook you look at, but it's 300, some will say 290, but we'll just stick with 300. So in normal state, the osmolarity of the ICF is 300, 
and of the ECF is 300. Now there's different physiological thing, things can happen or pathophysiological changes that can happen that can alter this. Um, and so we have to have a system. So first you have to identify if the extracellular fluid changes. So what are some examples of those changes? Well, you have fluid loss or gain. You can have, and then solute gain or loss. So fluid loss, you know, meaning you have like diarrhea or vomiting. So you lose a bunch of fluid that way. Fluid gain, meaning, you, you know, if you pump, I guess if you pumped someone through full of IV fluids, solute gain, you know, obviously you ingest a bunch of salt tablets would be one example of that or salt loss where you lose a bunch of solutes more so than just your volume. Does the ECF change cause a change in ECF osmolarity? So this is kind of a, a question you need to answer. If the answer is no, then no water is going to shift. So if the osmolarity is still equal between the ICF and the ECF, there's no need for any water to shift. Because remember, water is going to follow you the solutes because it's always going to want to have equal osmolarities between these two compartments. If the answer is yes, if the ECF change does cause a change in ECF osmolarity, then you need to figure out will water shift into or out of the cells and so that will help you determine um, how kind of the final rest final state or correctional state will be some things you want to be thinking about are you know is it volume contraction versus expansion and then also like we we're mentioning here the osmolarity the osmolarity of the disturbance. Are you losing a hypoosmotic amount of fluid or gaining a hyperosmotic amount of fluid? So these are the things you're gonna be paying attention to. All right, guys, we're gonna take a quick break from the case right now to let you know that DaVinci Cases is brought to you by DaVinci Academy, which provides online video courses for the medical basic sciences. These courses are taught using a variety of teaching methods, including bullet point outlines, diagrams, radiology images, and chalk talks, to explain the fundamental concepts. We then teach the application of those concepts to numerous clinical pearls that are frequently tested on medical school exams and the USMLE. Our video courses are available on our website, dviacademy.com, as monthly subscriptions starting at $9.99 per month. Each video course has a corresponding outline format textbook as well. You can find the link to our website in the description below. Also be sure to use the discount code DC20 to receive 20% off any of our video courses. Now back to the case. So going through some examples, so one, diarrhea. So with diarrhea, you're losing isoosmotic fluid. The fluid you are losing through the GI tract has the same osmolarity as the ECF, the ICF. So the amount of solutes, solutes, the, fra the relative fraction of solutes loss is the same as the water loss. It's not the same numerical amount, it's just that when you proportion it out, you've lost uh, a proportional amount of solute to water where that the remaining fluid in the ECF is still the same osmolarity. So you've essentially just lost ECF volume. So we'll draw a line in here. You've contracted the ECF volume. However, there's no change in the osmolarity of the ECF. So as a result, the ECF osmolarity is equal to the ICF osmolarity. So there's no water shift. Hence, again, the ECF volume is decreased. The ICF volume, there's no change because there's no shift that occurs here. There's no movement of water from the ICF to the ECF. And then as a result of that, the, the osmolarity of both the ECF and the ICF don't change. So then that's where you get this diagram. So if you remember, this is osmos, this is volume. So you've lost some volume in the ECF. There's no change in the ICF, as you can see up compared to normal state here. And there's no ch you have no change either way in osmolarity. Now with water deprivation, and a good example of that is someone being stranded out in the desert who's not drinking any water. They're in a very hot environment, so they're losing a lot of sweat. And so the thing about sweat actually is, is that sweat is hypoosmotic. Now what does that mean? It means that the concentration of solute in sweat is actually less than the ECF and hence less than the ICF. 
So when you're losing sweat, you're losing more fluid or water. You're losing more fluid than you are solute. You're still, you're still losing some solute, but the fraction of fluid you're losing is actually larger. And so with a loss of hypoosmotic fluid, what happens is, is that although you contract the volume of the ECF, what happens is that the actually the osmolarity actually increases because you still have all these solutes in here. And sure, you've lost some of them, but you've lost a greater portion of fluid. And so as a result of that, you've con you, by losing more fluid than you have solute, you, con you concentrate these solutes even more so. And so the osmolarity of the ECF actually increases. And so as a result of that, temporarily, the ECF osmolarity is actually greater than the ICF osmolarity. You know, by the natural state of things, water needs to shift out of cells to equilibrate that. So water is going to shift out of the ICF. So as a result of water shifting out of the ICF, you're going to lose some ICF volume. Now, as a result of that though, sure you've lost your ECF volume, and then as a result of having to shift fluid out of the ICF into the ECF, you've lost some ICF volume. But as a result of that, you've now made it so that the, the osmolarity of the ICF is equal to the ECF osmolarity. So, as, so since the ECF osmolarity was originally increased, as we indicate here, as a result of uh, equilibration, the ICF osmolarity has to be increased as well. So as a result of this, you have a decrease in the volume of both the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid, but you also have an increase in the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid, which are actually both equal to each other. So that's how, as I've kind of illustrated here, that's how you get this graph here. So this is what your representation of water deprivation. So if we look now, those were two examples of volume contraction. So if we look at volume expansion, so if you infuse sodium chloride, this would be the similar to infusing. Uh, when we say infusion, we mean through, you know, a peripheral IV, which means this would be, you know, essentially normal saline. Which is isoosmotic with the ECF or with blood. So the NS osmolarity or osmolarity of normal saline is equal to the ECF osmolarity, because that's what you're adding it to is the blood. So inf you infuse this isoosmotic fluid. So as a result of that, you're definitely going to increase the volume of the extracellular fluid, but you're not changing the osmolarity because the amount of solute that you've added is proportional to the amount of volume you've added, which is equal to the osmolarity in the ECF, in the extracellular fluid. So since this is all the same, the extracellular fluid osmolarity is still equal to the intracellular fluid osmolarity. So there's no need to have any water shift. So as a result of that, you've increased the extracellular fluid volume, the ICF volume has no change, and the osmolarity has no change of either. So that's how you get this diagram as I've illustrated here. Now, if you have high sodium chloride intake, essentially meaning you uh, do it PO or, or you know oral, PO is the same as oral. What this essentially would be equivalent to is if you, you know, ingested a bunch of salt or salt tablets, eat a big uh, bag of potato chips or something like that, a really salty meal. Um, so as a result of that, you're adding, uh, you know, sodium chloride to the ECF. So it's getting absorbed and into the bloodstream. And so as a result of that, you are going to increase the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid. You didn't increase the volume because you didn't take any fluid in with that. It's not like you threw it down with a glass of water, at least in this theoretical example. You just ate a bunch of salt. And so if you eat a bunch of salt by itself without throwing down a bunch of fluid with it, you're going to increase the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid. As a result of that, the osmolarity trans transiently is going to be greater than the intracellular fluid osmolarity. And so as a result of that, you're going to need to have a water shift. Water is going to need to shift out of cells or out of the intracellular fluid volume. And so as a result of that, you're going to decrease the volume of the ICF. And then since the osmolarity was already increased for the extracellular fluid, and then you have shifted this fluid out to equilibrate with the extracellular fluid, the osmolarity of the intracellular fluid is also going to increase. And so as a result of that, you get this diagram. And so the way you get this is remember, initially you didn't have any volume expansion, but since you're shifting fluid from the ICF to the ECF, you're going to expand that fluid out. 
And then remember, you already increased the osmolarity of the ECF. And so by moving fluid out of the intracellular fluid to further concentrate the solutes, you increase the osmolarity of the intracellular fluid as well. And so that's how you get this diagram where it's both shifted out to give you volume expansion and then increase osmolarity. So if we come back to the answer choices, you know, this is a patient with severe water deprivation. So we need to go through these answer choices. So you look at this, this has no change in osmolarity. This is the final state. It just has an increase in extracellular fluid volume. So what does that sound like? It sounds like an infusion of sodium chloride, like we just went over. So you look at this second one here, answer choice B. So it's the kind of the opposite of this one. You have no change in osmolarity. You just have a loss in volume, an ECF volume. So down here, we just went over this. You have high sodium chloride intake. Again, you had an increase in the osmolarity from adding sodium chloride in. As a result of that, fluid came from the cells into the extracellular fluid. That increases the volume. And then as a result of that, concentrate that fluid loss from the cells, you increase the concentration of the osmolarity. For this answer choice, you've lost ECF volume, but the osmolarity has stayed the same. So that corresponds to what we talk about with diarrhea. And then this last answer choice, you have both a loss of fluid volume, you have a loss of sweat. In the case of our patient, which is hypoosmotic, so you're losing more fluid than you are solutes. So you've increased the osmolarity here, as you can see here. As a result of that, you have to have shift some fluid out of the cells, so you're going to lose some volume there. And then as a result of that, you're going to further concentrate the solutes and increase the osmolarity of the intracellular fluid. And so that's what gives us our answer choice of choice D for this patient with water deprivation. All right, that's all I have for you this time. Be sure to check out all the DaVinci Cases videos available on our YouTube channel and our website, dviacademy.com. The PDF notes for every DaVinci Cases is also available on our website. Also be sure to check out our podcast, The DaVinci Hour, where we interview attendings and residents across medicine to learn more about their experiences, their specialties, and to get their insights on navigating a career in medicine. You can find The DaVinci Hour podcast on our website or any platform where podcasts are found. Lastly, you can find all of our video courses and corresponding outline format books on our website. Don't forget to use the discount code DC20 for 20% off.